Hi, my name is Dr. English, and today we're going to talk about some of the basics of the periodic table. Specifically, we're going to go over a little bit on who was Dmitry Mendeleev, talk about the contribution of Henry Moseley, look at the basic structure of the periodic table, talk about different classes of elements, talk about allotropes, and the overall physical states of elements on the periodic table. So we start our conversation about the periodic table with a man named Dmitry Mendeleev. Now, there were many people around this time that were talking about the organization of the periodic table and making contributions to the periodic table, but when history identifies one person that basically gets the credit for the development of the periodic table, it's typically Mendeleev because he was the first one to really publish his works back in 1869. We acknowledge him with the development of the first table of elements. And the important thing that we need to realize with the work of, of Mendeleev is that he organized the elements based on increasing atomic mass. So the first periodic table, if you're ever to find an old one and you look at the arrangement, or if you were to look at Mendeleev's periodic table and you look at the arrangement of the elements, they would all be by atomic mass. This is before anybody knew about the idea of an isotope. The other key thing that Mendeleev did was that he placed elements with similar properties in the same group. So we'll talk about groups and periods today, but his thing was he looked at different characteristics of the elements and he thought, you know, these all look and behave pretty similarly, so I'm gonna put them together in one group. Then we have Henry Moseley. Now what Moseley did was he is credited with rearranging the periodic table based on atomic number, which we know is the number of protons. Because we think about elements and we think about carbon 12 and carbon 14, they're both carbon, they both have six protons, but carbon 12 has six neutrons while carbon 14 has eight neutrons. Mosley was the one that said, you know what, the one thing that's constant from element to element is the number of protons in the atom. So let's tweak the periodic table a little bit and let's base it on the subatomic particle of protons. He also wrote something known as the periodic law. And the periodic law states the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. And again, when we talk about atomic numbers, we mean number of protons. Now you might be saying to yourself, what do we mean by periodic functions? When we look up the word periodic, periodic means repeating, recurring, something that occurs at regular intervals. Now let's look at the structure of the periodic table. There's two major things that you need to know at the very beginning. The periodic table is arranged in vertical columns called groups and horizontal rows called periods. So when I say, hey, let's look at group two or let's look at group one. If I say, let's look at group one, we're looking at these elements right here. Or let's look at group 14. That means we're looking at the elements that are in this column right here, that's group 14. When we talk about, hey, let's look at the elements that are in period three, then we're looking at elements that are in period three, we're including that. There's no elements in the middle here, so this would all, whoa, a little crazy. This is all period three. Or let's look at period six. Period six elements would include everything along here, quite a few of them going back around. Let's see if we can finish the circle. Oh, terrible. But these are the elements in period six. So groups and periods. Now we're going to examine the periods of the periodic table. So the periods are the horizontal rows and we see them row one through seven. Two things that you need to realize about periods. Elements within the same period have the same number of occupied principal energy levels. And remember, the term that we used for principal energy level was also shells. Here's period four right here. If we just look at a snapshot of part of period four, we'll see that they all have four shells or four principal energy level. No matter what element along here, they each have four shells involved with them. So that's what they mean. So every element within period four has four shells that are occupied. Let's look at this second statement here. Elements in the same period have valence electrons in the same principal energy level. And again, we can think of principal energy level as shells. 
That means when we look at these electron configurations and we say, where are the valence electrons? They will always be in the fourth shell. For potassium, it has one valence electron, and that's in the fourth shell. Calcium has two valence electrons, that's in the fourth shell. Scandium has two valence electrons, fourth shell. If we go down to vanadium, it has four shells, two valence electrons in the outermost shell. So the valence electrons, no matter what it is, whether it's titanium or chromium, their valence electrons all occupy the same principal energy level or shell. Now let's talk about groups. Groups are the vertical columns 1 through 18 on your periodic table. For groups 1, 2, 13 through 18, elements within the same group have the same number of valence electrons. The exception is helium because helium is in the first period and we know the maximum number of electrons that can be in the first period is 2, so helium is an exception to the rule. So let's look at group 1. If you look at group 1 as you go down the period, Every element here, from lithium to sodium to potassium, rubidium, cesium, or francium, any of these elements here all have one valence electron. Same thing with group 2. If we look at group 2, all the electron configurations end with 2. 2 for beryllium, 2 for magnesium, 2 for calcium, strontium has 2 valence electrons, barium has 2 valence electrons, and radium has 2 valence electrons. So as we go down the group, they all have the same number of valence electrons. The other thing that we're going to learn as we look more closely at each group in future videos is that elements within the same group are going to have similar chemical properties. They won't be exactly the same, but they're going to behave in similar ways. For example, one of the things that you're going to learn about group 1 metals is that they are very reactive in water. So. Uh, whether it's group 1 or group 2, you're going to find that the general trend is that they're going to have similar chemical properties. Now let's talk about how do we classify an element. One way to classify an element is to look at its physical properties. And physical properties describe characteristics that do not change the identity of the element. So many physical properties are contained in table S of your reference table. So you need to look at table S and say, can you find the information to find the melting point of an element, or the boiling point, or the density, because different elements are going to have different physical properties. Let's look at some characteristics of metals. Now metals are located generally on the left-hand side of the periodic table. The majority of them are going to be solids at room temperature. The only exception is mercury, and we'll talk about mercury more a little bit later. They typically are shiny or have luster. They're malleable, which means they can be pounded into thin sheets. So if you think about the word malleable, the base word of that is mallet, and a mallet is a type of hammer. They are ductile. In other words, you can draw them into thin wires. If you've ever seen copper wire before, copper wire comes obviously from the element copper, and we say that copper is ductile. Typically, metals are good conductors of heat and electricity. If you've ever touched a hot seatbelt during the summer, you'll know that that metal is really, really hot. Uh, and if you've ever been shocked by a piece of metal, yeah, they can conduct electricity. They have low ionization energies and electronegativity values, which those two statements probably don't mean very much to you right now, but we're going to keep that, uh, and we're going to come back to that later. And the last thing that you need to know about metals is they tend to lose electrons to form positive ions. And that's an important thing to think about because if you look at your periodic table and you look over at the left-hand side of the periodic table, all those metals are going to have positive charges associated with them. You're not going to see any negative charges. They would have much rather lose electrons than gain electrons. Now let's talk about characteristics of the transition metals. And the transition metals are in the middle of your periodic table. They're going to include groups 3 through 12. And there's a couple of key things that you need to know about the transition metals. They are typically, not all of them, but typically hard solids with high melting points. And to find the melting points, again, we could go to table S of your reference table and look it up. For an example, tungsten, W, has a melting point of 3,680 Kelvin. And the Kelvin temperature system is something that we'll be talking about later. But let's just put it out there. that That's pretty high. Tungsten has one of the highest melting points out of metals on the periodic table. Again, here's our exception, mercury, which is a liquid at room temperature. And here's the little image 
brought to you courtesy of periodictable.com that shows mercury at room temperature as a liquid. The other things that you should know about the transition metals is that the ions, so when these metals appear in compounds and are dissolved, appear colored in solutions. So we're going to see blues, we're going to see yellows, we might see some reds. They can generally form different charged ions. So if you look in the center of your periodic table, and again, this is a general trend. It doesn't apply to all the elements that compose the transition metals, but something like sodium, which is in group one, which is not a transition metal, can only form a plus one ion. Compare that to something like copper, which if you find copper on your periodic table, that can form a plus one or a plus two ion. Now let's talk about the metalloids, or otherwise known as the semi-metals. What we're going to look at are the elements of boron, germanium, antimony, silicon, arsenic, and tellurium, and you need to be familiar with these. So the metalloids are located along the staircase, separating the metals from the non-metals. If you look at this little image of a periodic table down here, all the red elements are going to be metals, all the blue elements are going to be non-metals, and the yellow elements right here are our metalloids. When we look at metalloids, these are elements that have properties between those of metals and nonmetals. So when we talk about bonding later on, they're gonna have partially ionic bonds or partially covalent bonds. Now let's look at our nonmetals. Now this does not include group 18. In New York State, they take group 18 and they classify it as their own separate category. Most periodic tables are going to include group 18 as nonmetals, but for right now, we're going to keep them separate. Nonmetals are located generally to the right of the periodic table. These tend to be gases, molecular solids, which we'll talk about later, and network solids, which we'll also talk about later. In the solid phase, some of these will be brittle or lackluster, literally meaning lacking luster. They are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Again, we'll talk about these topics later, but they have high ionization energies and high electronegativities. And these are elements that are electron acceptors. In other words, they'd like to gain some electrons to look like the closest element in group 18. So they are going to take electrons. And we know that electrons have negative charges. So when these elements pick up electrons, they're going to form negative ions. Examples of nonmetals include sulfur, phosphorus, bromine, and bromine is a liquid at room temperature, which would mean definitely not a metal. It doesn't have those properties. Another example would be sulfur, which is brittle and yellow. Definitely not malleable, definitely not ductile. Finally, let's look at the characteristics of the noble gases. The noble gases include all elements of group 18. They do not have the properties of other nonmetals. They're typically non-reactive because if we look at their end shell, with the exception again of helium, they're all going to end with the number eight. We're gonna learn soon about something known as the octet rule, and that's gonna make them pretty non-reactive. So with the exception of helium, they have eight valence electrons in their outermost shell. They tend not to form compounds unless under extreme pressure and temperatures. And this is the reason why krypton and xenon have oxidation states or charges associated with them because under duress, krypton and xenon can form compounds with fluorine, but it's only under extreme situations. For the most part, what you need to know about the noble gases it is that they're pretty non-reactive. They're not gonna react with anything else. One might even call them inert. They're inert gases, in other words, non-reactive. Allotropes, what is an allotrope? An allotrope is when non-metals exist in two or more forms in the same phase. So in this first example right here, we're gonna talk about two forms of oxygen that are different, but they're both in the gas phase. So they're in the same phase because they're both gases. So oxygen gas versus ozone gas. Allotropes have different physical properties and chemical properties. This is a representation of oxygen that you and I can breathe to live. This is a representation of ozone. They both include just oxygen, but they are bound together differently. They have different numbers of oxygens. Therefore, they are allotropes of each other because they're gonna have different physical properties and chemical properties, but they exist only of oxygen. Another allotrope that you need to be familiar with are carbon allotropes. These are ones that you've definitely interacted with. If you've ever written with a pencil, you're writing with graphite. Graphite is an allotrope of carbon. Diamond is an allotrope of carbon. The Buckminster Fullerene is an allotrope of carbon. 
They're all made of carbon, but they behave in different ways because of chemical properties. Allotropes of carbon have different physical properties and different chemical properties, but they are all made out of carbon and they're all in the solid state. Finally, let's talk about states of elements. So how do elements appear at normal pressure and temperature, which we call STP? So at standard temperature and pressure, most elements are solids at room temperature, with the exception of mercury, which is a metal, and bromine, which is a nonmetal. They're going to be liquids at room temperature. Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine, and the noble gases are all going to be nonmetal gases. And we have some images of these elements down here at the bottom. So what did we learn in this tutorial? We went over very, very briefly who was Mendeleev and his contributions to the periodic table. We talked about Henry Moseley and the periodic law. We looked at the general structure of the periodic table. We talked about different classes of elements, allotropes, and the states of the elements at STP. Need more help? Please feel free to contact me. Have a great day.